Welcome to the Kit Car History File series where we'll be going through the industry's past. We'll be visiting old marks of long ago, some modern ones, some mostly older stuff, a lot of archive information with photographs and information on the cars they made, the people involved and what happened to them. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Total Kit Car History File series. My name is Steve Holt, editor of TKC Mag and TotalKitCar.com. And welcome to the Total Kicker YouTube channel, indeed. Um, a warm welcome back if you're an old hand around here, and a welcome to you if you're new. Um, and please, I hope you find what you're looking for here, and you enjoy what we've got to offer, and uh, have a little explore around the rest of the channel, the uh, rest of the videos that we've already got up um, on the site or on the channel, and find something that you like. Just to let you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best to cover what is now a 75-year-old industry, the UK's kit car industry, and indeed the subject of this episode, I'm delighted to say, is what who we regard really as our as the father of our industry. Um, a lovely old chap called Derek Buckler. You may or may not have heard of, even if you haven't, don't worry. We're going to cover his career and life here in this very episode. So without further ado, let's get cracking, I think. Um, as I say, Derek was a cracking old fella. Uh, never met him. Would love to have done. He's one of my heroes of, of this industry. Uh, and, he's, and as we'll discover, there's some fantastic stories about him um, showing what a lovely character he was and how set in his ways he was, really. Um <laughs> He's, uh, I've written and I've spoken before about some of the quirks that Derek had. Um, um, I'm make no apologies for for covering them again here because it's all in the right place. This one as we're covering Derek. I'm new enough uh, over my Darth Vader uh, husky voice. Um, I was uh, that chest infection I had that made me sound like dear old Darth. Um, it's nearly gone, but if you hear a few sound effects that are a bit strange and a bit puzzling, that is me. Uh, but I am getting better. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, as I said five minutes ago, Chad Chadwick Derek Frank Buckler is the subject of our episode today. He was born in Hornsey, North London, real Lotus Territory, that. Uh, in September, September the 26th, to be precise, 1910. After school, he, he went straight to work. He left school, I think, at 14, 15, and he went straight to work at his father's, uh, Father Frank's uh, educa engineering company, beg your pardon, uh, between 1927 and 29. I don't know who he was doing immediately post-school, but uh, that's where he was in those those years. Um, he then had a change of direction, a strange one really, I suppose. He he, he, he worked for a, a London law firm, um, a firm of solicitors, until 1933. And that was indeed the year that he married a lady called Molly. In the meantime, his father, who sounds like a real entrepreneur, he'd founded a, a successful business, um, well, dairy business, milk deliveries. Now, maybe depending on where you live in the world, you might need to look up the term milk float and milk round because they were kind of, I'm not sure other parts of the world, maybe the US did, or maybe Canada, but the rest of the world you might be scratching your head. So you need to have a, a little session on Google. And if you look up UK milk float and milk round, then you'll hopefully come up to speed on that. But that's what his father ran at that time. It was called Watford Dairies, home just north of uh, north north of uh, London. They they were diverse professions. Um, his little bit of engineering, a couple of years there, and and four years of of, of legal um, working for a legal company. But I think he, he always, I read that he always saw that as standing him in good stead because one showed him how things needed to be done by the book and the other showed him that he could run a business and helped him, in fact, with administrative stuff and such like. <coughs> Excuse me. When his father died uh, in 1938, Derek and um, I think it might have been his older brother, Murray, they used their, in, their respective inheritances to jointly purchase... Um, two motor engineering companies. Uh, one was Johnston Roberts Limited back in Hornsey and the other was a, a flowing name of the Barkus Engineering and Light Aircraft Company who were based in Reading in Berkshire, Royal Berkshire in fact. 
Um, both those companies just happen to be precision engineering shops, um, to, uh, primarily to the motor, motor trade. And it wasn't long before the Buckler brothers realised that it was not going to be satisfactory to run the companies as a double act. So naturally decided to, to, to go their separate ways. Murray took over the full ownership of Johnston and Roberts, Roberts, who were later actually to do much of the machining work for Lotus in their earlier days, certainly in Hornsey and perhaps when they went to Chesson. Uh, meanwhile, Derek took over the Barkus um, uh, company and he renamed that um, Bucklers in 1939. During the war, they were busy making all sorts of... Um, machinery and particularly towards the end of the war they were designing and manufacturing components to reinstate war damage uh, in particular a lightweight tubular cradle which could help engineers see their way or find their way along power lines and and, and also portable hydraulic tools which were used to repair railway lines that have been bombed and such like and were out of service and were needed um, Wellco was a company called, sorry, Wellco, beg your pardon, jumping forward slightly there, um, what, what company called Wellco Farm Implements, who made things like corn crushing machines and such like for the agricultural and farm trade. They'd been a good company at, of, of Derrick's um, during the war, but um, they ran up a slight debt, or big debt with him, um, and Mr Wells, the boss of Wellco, was facing bankruptcy, and Derrick helped him out. Um, offset the debt against taking over the company and his and his premises, um, and apparently the factory premises had little value. But they did give Derek um, much needed space to develop what came, what was coming soon after his uh, range of accessories and um, the chassis he produced. And I do believe, actually, um, that uh, Buckler continued making or producing that Welco stuff, the hammer mills and various other things, um, right into the mid-50s, I think, which is when his work, uh, his automotive work, really was requiring more staff and more time than he had to spare. So I think that's kind of why Welco had to go. Although I do believe you could buy spares way into the 60s. Um, from a motorsport kind of uh, side, Derek was a competitive motorcyclist in tests and trials. That was in the early 30s before the Second World War. Um... But then, obviously, he got into cars, and we, I believe the first car he owned was a was a, uh, a Ford Eight. But even then, he was showing signs of being wanting to be a modifier and converter, and he replaced the engine with a tuned Ford Ten unit, which had a, about another one and a half horsepower, probably. I don't know, not very much, but he certainly uh, laid out what he was up, what he was up to in terms of his future career. And uh, he always had an interest in uh, um, driving faster, so I'm led to believe. And a fascinating, um, fas oh, sorry, a burgeoning fascination for motorsport, which by the mid, well, 46, 47, was beginning to slowly start again after the, 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 the obviously, the war, war years. Um, Derek's first prototype... And really, his mobile showroom for his fledging company, if you think about it. It's a famous car, uh, registered DDP 201. Respect respectively, became known as the Buckler Special. And I've also seen that referred to as the Buckler Colonial Special. Um, sometimes I see that and sometimes I don't. Uh, regardless, no one seems to know how or where or what the Colonial element means in relation to that. So we'll just call it the Buckler Special, I think. One thing for sure, again, Derek was experimenting. Because some weekends I'm led to believe, again, that he would use, the car would be fitted with a supercharger. Uh, another one, following weekend, it perhaps wouldn't. While he also messed around with gear ratios, and exper full experimentation was going on. But he certainly was very successful, and he achieved over 200 wins and podiums in that car. So I guess it's no surprise that other 
budding or even returning enthusiasts post-war were fascinated with what he was doing and inevitably, I mean, I can go through a list of long as long as my arm of companies of where that started as a result of somebody wanting a, rep, a replica of um, someone's car. That's that's kind of etched in stone, that one. And so it was with Derek. People just wanted a copy of, of his car that was successful. Um, government manufacturing restrictions at of the time and don't forget we were still in uh, in the UK we were still facing or well, they were facing petrol rationing and all sorts of shortages and just trying to recover from the savages of war really ravages of war I should say uh, and, and obviously they, it was a, Derek had a lack of capital and I, I, I'm again I believe he wanted to start a production line fully built replicas of Hobby's little car but he saw there was a loophole to that existed that allowed him to offer his car in a component form which obviously had the huge advantage of saving customers a large amount of purchase tax um, and again yeah but when he started offering chassis kits of that of DDP 201 this is that was in 1949 and there we see that in 2024 we're 75 years old and he can rightly be regarded as the father of the UK's kit car industry. And that was also, he, he have, he's advertising straight away. We'll flash a couple of adverts up, I think, from here with this uh, video. And you'll see he was he was uh, properly advertising his wares. Uh, enthusiasts were, not only were they hungry for go faster cars and bits for their existing cars, but they were hungry for competition that they'd been starved of. And there were plenty of companies like Derek supplying go faster components for want of a better description. Speed equipment, I suppose, is more accurate. But I think when you had a 1930s clapped out Austin 7 running on one cylinder or something, if you could bolt something to it to make it go faster and sound less evil, then I think that was obviously seen as a, as a go faster component. And certainly there were people taking advantage and inevitably we get the scammers and the weasels. And there were certainly a lot of charlatans selling little more than snake oil. But there were some very good pioneering ones. One that sticks out a little bit, well, he was a, one of Derek's rivals in, in, in later years, but certainly predated him uh, in what he was doing. It was another wonderful chap who will also star in, in an episode of Total Kick Car History Files. Uh, Leslie Bellamy. Don't make the mistake of, think, of spelling his name Bellamy because that wasn't true. His name was Bellamy. <coughs> Excuse me. And he ran a company or started a company called LMB Components. And if you're a compete competitor in the late 40s and your car featured input from the LMB Components catalogue, you certainly had a definite edge. Unrivaled, really, I guess, until Derek Buckler got going, really got going. Dear old Les had, well, risen to stardom, or, or shall we say relative stardom, in the 30s, actually, by off, by by splitting a beam axle front front um, splitting a front beam axle, <coughs> which would transform the way that uh, an Austin 7 would handle. And he sold hundreds of those. And he also took over the Atlanta mark as well. And um, <coughs> excuse me again, was still was one of the first to offer a fiberglass or glass fiber body in the early 50s. As I said, we'll definitely do an episode on Leslie because his story is fascinating and he was equally a character as much as as Derek. But anyway, Derek thought that, like what Leslie was doing, but certainly reckoned he could do better and attempted to do that with his own um, beam axle or split beam axle um, kit, which he sold lots of. And Derek was a founder, a uh, co-founder, shall we say. Um, well, no, he was an enthusiastic participant in 750 Motor Club activities. Certainly the same <coughs> area club or the 750 that uh, Colin Chapman and others and Mike Costin were going to. <coughs> and indeed, Colin Chapman and he, Derek, were, were co-founders of the 1172 formula. And as a result, naturally enough, Bucklers and Lotuses soon became fierce rivals in motorsport. 
although Derek uh, was supplying the close ratio gear sets for all the three early three speed Lotuses. And in, I'm, I'm, I believe that Colin Chapman himself would personally come to see Derek's workshop in Reading to collect them. And I think that's what really floated Derek's boat. He loved the idea that he could give the average man, either a demob serviceman or just a young enthusiast, um, he would give them a chance to either turn their old Ford 8, Ford 10, Austin 7 into a sporty, lightweight car or improve that car that, as I said earlier, might well be clapped out. And he did it in a way, he did it so that he was offering top quality stuff, but he was still only charging pocket money prices, which is probably one of the criticisms of Derek. He was selling stuff too cheaply. But they were also into engine reconditioning, they were decoking, they were precision machining, they were white metal casting, making leaf springs and road wheels to, to any diameter and specification. And the base in Reading, because he'd taken over the Welco, Welco company, he had a chance, uh, the opportunity to, to offer to do sales and various other activities. <clears throat> and he, as I say, he was a fine engineer and his chassis kits were superb. There's the famous story that he's, his first car was the Mark V and it wasn't, he, he hadn't done four others before it. It was because he didn't want people to think he was a fly-by-night or, or a chancer. Uh, and, and indeed, he didn't want people to think he was a rookie and wet behind the ears, which I love that story. But certainly the chassis itself was a, was a fine, was a fine thing. Uh, and early on, he was offering three different types of space frame. So... You had the Buckler Cars range, which at that time, early on, was the Mark V, and the longer wheelbase Mark VI, based around E four nine three A. The Mark V was based on E ninety three A pop, and four nine three A being the prefect, if my memory serves me right. Um, so, but then alongside that, he also had his uh, range of performance equipment, and within that catalogue, um, there were three different space frames. And he was also a, a pioneer of the backbone chassis structure. So if you think Lotus Alain or Baby Alain, that'll give you an idea on what a backbone chassis looks like with the central spine of a Lotus Alain. You'll get the idea of that. Uh, Derek was, if not before Chapman, he was certainly around the same time that Chapman was doing that. And talking to Chap, uh, Chapman, Buckler, <laughs> Derek, I know they were acquaintances. I don't think they were friends. Um... Derek was always very, very protective of his chassis. Or anything, really, that he'd fabricated and designed and fabricated. And very suspicious about other manufacturers taking a uh, an interest in his work. and Because he never knew that they might try and steal his ideas. And Colin Chapman was one he was particularly concerned about. And that particular paranoia was said to be the reason that Derek kept all his blueprints away from the works. Uh, preferring to keep them under lock and key at home. Um, and that, I find that quite charming as well, but fair enough to him. Anyway, Mark 5 and 6, there were derivatives of that, as Derek always tended to do. Um, most minor based Mark 5 MM um, and a four-seater called the Mark 6 4, quite logical naming, a nomenclature if you think about it. Most of those early bucklers were designed primarily around the, the 1172 formula, which is understandable given that he instigated that. Um, and those rules basically were very tight, but they, in essence, you, that car had to have a Ford, uh, Ford side valve, four-cylinder engine, three-speed gearbox and rod-operated Ford drum brakes. Um... Derek's catalogue continued to grow very quickly. Um, and Bill Boddy, the, the, the icon, well, he's a bit of an icon in the journalist game, motoring, motoring journalism, uh, editor of Motorsport back then, he was always very keen to promote Buckler, as was Charles Bulmer, the technical editor of The Motor. By the 50s, mid-50s, when, as I said earlier, things were getting very busy and Welco had to close down, 
Derek had a right hand man called Mark Cook and he's said to have done a lot of good for the business. Um, one interesting little factoid about Mark Cook was, and I love this one, he was once personal secretary secretary to Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. Um, which not everybody can say that they were uh, <laughs> Field Marshal Montgomery's uh, right hand man. And Cook was very popular with customers. Um, and I sense even acted as a buffer between the boss and the punters as, as I think Derek could uh, be a bit brusque and didn't suffer fools gladly, the old cliche, but I think it's true, very much in his case. Uh, one, one other thing about um, Mark Cook, he was a very talented mathematician, genius, I've, heard, I've, I've seen used to, to define him. Uh, and I think his technical drawing was good. So if a customer came in, and Derek was very keen to produce bespoke parts. So if you walked in and said, I need ABC bracket that goes from there to there, and it has to be this long, he'd measure it up and um, he would make it for you. He'd work into the night to do that, indeed. I think that's true, definitely true. So Mark Cook was able to, he's a good technical drawer, so he would be able to draw that and, tran and transpose that to a piece of paper that Derek could understand and, and the work, Derek or the workshop could produce the necessary parts, which in pre-CAD days, obviously, was, was vital, really because he could do it very well and, and he could do it accurately. Derek was never, was never, even though his cars, and he used to, in fact, promote the fact that he, he, his, his customers were very successful on track in, on his, in his adverts and in, in his catalogues. But I don't, I, I always get the sense he wasn't chasing lap records or championship wins. I go back to the fact he wanted to give the ordinary Joe blogs in the street, the chance to just enjoy himself and his car, go on track and go faster on the road. And that seems to be the thing that really kept him, um, you know, brought satisfaction to him, really. Uh, and saving people money, I think, was a big, big buckler um, selling point. He liked the economy point of view, and in 1953 he took part, jumping forward slightly here, but he, he took part in the wonderfully named National Road Fuel Economy Contest, organised by the Cheltenham Motor Club, and he achieved an amazing 93 miles per gallon over, over the set course. And to prove it is no fluke, he came back in 54 and won it again, this time achieving slightly less, uh, less, less frugal figures, but still very good at 86.6 mpg. Um, by the 50s, by that same time in the 50s, Buckler's performance parts list was in, included stuff like close ratio gears, split split axle independent front suspension kits, camshaft, remote gear linkages. He did a very, very nice and popular line of nine spring clutch pressure plates for the full pop. He produced gauges, instruments rather, high pressure cylinder head gaskets um, and, and, and inlet manifolds as well as more mundane, arguably, offerings such as switch gear and even padded squabs for seats to make your seats more comfortable. And and, and that performance parts catalogue, um, I think um, towards the end of um, the company's life, they, they even introduced some portable aluminium garages available in various sizes and colours. So for the guy that didn't have, or the person that didn't have a garage or access to a workshop, you could put one up in your in your front garden, even or your back garden, and I think that um, that's much like Machine Mart do now. Really, they do a demountable garage range. So again, Derek was ahead of his time. Really, he probably, and it's probably fair to say this, he probably made too much of the stuff he sold in house. Great for quality control, but not great always for cash flow. And I remember personally going to, when I worked on a magazine called Sports Car at the turn of the century, I uh, went to visit uh, TVR in Blackpool, which at that time was still run by the late and uh, wonderfully effervescent and um, talking about Bruce could not suffer in fools gladly, but I always found him absolutely brilliant, Peter Wheeler. Peter was like Derek, I think, a later version who believed in what he was doing and wouldn't be wouldn't be swayed from the path that he was on. 
I wouldn't be sort of diverted from the path he was on. And I remember saying to Wheeler, because if you recall, the, that generation of TVR, um, um, thinking primarily of the Griffith, the Chimera and the uh, Cerbera, for example, had wonderful little stalks for indicators and um, windscreen wipers and they had little lovely turned and knurled um, knobs and switches that controlled things like heating and um, other elements of, of control on the car, like lights even. But um, And I said to Peter Wheeler, how much of, of the switch gear or how much of this stuff do you make in-house? And he looked me in the eye and said, far too much, laddie. Um, but I like it that way, or words to that effect. And I think that was Derek, in a nutshell. He could certainly supply everything you needed to produce a Ford-based buckler, although there were two areas, really, where he didn't get involved in. He was a, he didn't really have any hobbies other than, I think, he liked football, Tottenham Hotspur, to be precise. Um, and he was a supporter of junior boxing. And he also stood, um, while we're talking about that, he stood as a, um, uh, um, uh, for a seat on... Reading Council in 1950 for the Conservative Party, but I believe he, well, he lost, didn't get a seat. But other than that, he didn't really have many hobbies to speak of. Um, but he was a massive admirer of Henry Ford. And I guess if you think about it, he was trying to offer quality at a low price. He was kind of, in his own way, a million times smaller, trying to mirror what Henry Ford had done with the um, introduction of the, of the Model T Ford. But he always thought that Ford's brakes were effective, very simple, but very effective at stopping cars, and uh, obviously his cars as well, by uh, by default. And he wouldn't try, and he didn't didn't want to better them or try and better them. Good few customers disagreed, and they went their own way. But that was nothing to do with Derek. I think that Derek suffered in many ways from, uh, and we'll come on to this. In fact, I should have come to have dealt with this before. Uh, he didn't offer any body, he didn't run well for most of the company's life. They didn't offer a body shell. So you, so a Mark V could have anybody fitted. I mean, the idea was that he, his original concept was that his chassis were so designed that it would be easy for the man in his garage to create their own bodywork out of aluminium sheets. That was his original intention. And, of course, then people wanted um, commercial commercial bodies, proprietary bodies, and he wouldn't do that. He didn't. I'll come to why in a short while, but he wouldn't do that. Um, so, he, But he would direct you to a panel beater that could produce you one in aluminium. And when glass fibre came on, um, for car use came on stream quite strongly in 19... Well, 53, 50, well, 54, really... He got heavily involved in that and he became, and he would actively recommend companies of the day like Gault Glass or Durasteel, the Gault Glass um, division. Michael Plassey, in fact, he had a contract with them for the Mistral body. Rochdale, RGS and Versal um, were, were some, but there were others. Um, but he would not supply you a body directly. I can't, as I said, I'll come to that in a short while. And I think he suffered from that because... Whereas uh, a Ginetta or an Ashley or a Falcon, just plucking three names out of the air, and indeed a Lotus, had its own identity because everybody knew what a Lotus 7 was. Uh, everybody knew what a G4 was. Everybody knew what, um, well, any, any special car. They, they had their own identity because they had their own body, body shell. Because Derek's cars never had a, um, a, a specific body shell, nobody really knew, unless you knew, you didn't know it was a buckler. And that's a fact, really. And I think he suffered from that. But more on that shortly, very shortly. Um, he would list aluminium bodies later on and listed aluminium bodies in his catalogue. What had happened was, because he'd overtake, could he taken over that Welco premises, he had quite a few outbuildings. And Derek was always very keen to give junior or, or smart up, start up artisans a chance to earn a living. So he'd very often rent out some of those outbuildings to, to fledgling companies. And just so happened that one of them was a was a company called C.F. Taylor, brackets metal workers, and they were one of the early um, renters of space at Derek's premises. And it just so happened that that, that Taylor's could offer you a body to suit Derek's cars. 
C.F. Taylor's an interesting character. He later moved on, the company later moved on to, I think, Wokingham and gave up um, metal bashing for cars. But they did become one of the leading um, makers of aeroplane interiors, aircraft interiors for various airlines and such like and manufacturers. And I believe that C.F. Taylor, I don't know his surname, no one seems to have done. I, I, I thought it was Clifford, but I might be wrong. Um, <clears throat> became a very, very wealthy man and good luck to him for that. And I believe his company was a re- sort of take, I think at one stage towards the end of their life, were taken over by British Aerospace and absorbed into that massive organisation. So he did very well for himself. Um, his place at uh, Derek's um, Wilco Works was taken by a company called Bristow & Son. Uh, they didn't last long um, before the third and final incumbent was a chap called uh, Johnny Offord. Um, and he, um, again, could offer bodies to suit Derek's cars but you'd have to make your arrangement with him and you'd get two invoices you'd get one from Buckler's for your chassis and other related kit parts but the body shell would come with a an invoice from Taylor Bristow and Son or Johnny Offord um he wasn't he he didn't like to do well one of the reasons about the reason he didn't do body shells was he didn't he didn't like because of his legal um, background he didn't like he always liked to remain within the law and he saw that that companies the other specials companies like lotus and heron and diva were um slightly bending the rules by producing fully built cars or comprehensive kits and he didn't like that he saw it he didn't think it was cricket so that's one of the reasons he didn't get involved in that uh, but he did sometimes bend the rules uh, while remaining within the law. So, for example, a customer could ask, and if he was the right day at the right time of year and he was in the right mood, um, could ask for a car to be completed by the works, but they would be expected. There was no escaping the purchase tax. Derek would insist on you having to pay the purchase tax, which could be as much as 40% extra. Um... But I think he really suffered because there were no dedicated body, bodies for his cars. As I said, it wasn't identifiable. You couldn't easily identify a Buckler Mark V. You just couldn't. But again, I think there was another side to that. And I think he liked the fact that, albeit on a smaller scale, he was like Rolls-Royce and Bentley, who produced chassis that coach builders placed bodies on for the customer. On a much smaller scale, of course. And there was a, a fantastic, another fantastic Derek story was that unless he'd seen your finished car, either in person on a Saturday morning <coughs> or, that, or you sent him a, um, some good f- photographs, you weren't allowed to have a, uh, an enamel buckler bonnet badge. Um, and I could, I just love, I don't know if he did, but I'd love the idea of him with a shoot with a pointing stick under his arm and a blazer coming out with freshly brew creamed hair, walking up and down a line of bucklers and uh, eager or sort of anxious owners waiting to be awarded their buckler bonnet badge. I think that's fabulous. I think there was a serious side to that, actually. Well, one, because Derek wanted, didn't want people building rubbish for sure. But the serious side of that was because he knew that some of his cars, to be honest and with respect, were atrocious and looked like they'd been built with a, with a toolkit that consisted of a knife, a fork and a hammer. He knew that some of those those cars weren't really going to be of the highest standard. And don't get me wrong, some the fact that quite a few exist now proves the integrity and the quality of the components that were used under the skin. And I like that philosophy, and I but I, and I, and I find it hard to criticise um, a hero um, for that steadfastness, really. But it was his way, I think, of if he did, if he thought, my gosh, what is that? He wouldn't give you a, bon- a bonnet badge. Simple as that. And that was his prerogative. Um, other models appeared. Mark V and Mark VI were the mainstay. And they were the ones that lasted all through the company's history. But other models appeared. And we had stuff like the the Mark X, which is based on 49.3A. Longer but similar, Mark XI, based on the prefect. So the same concept as from 5 and 6. 
but those two both had three abreast seating, bench seat. Then there was the Morris Minor Bake Mark 15, and again a similar Mark 16, but that later, the later one had a mixture of Morris Minor M MG TCTD components. Uh, components. And he also by 53 he was in he was launched he launched the Mark 53, which was a trials specific buckler model really. Trials were pretty popular back then, um, as they are now to to to, to a select few. Um, but back then you had the Lexus that were doing very well, and obviously Mike Cannon's cars that were doing very well. And Derek wanted some of the action, and indeed I think you'll still find the old buckler on the hill. He, he was a founder member of the Hanson Barks Motor Club and a proud member of the BARC um, and several other motoring clubs. And contrary to what people might think about him only selling his cars in, in, in the UK, far from it. I mean, he was actively, uh, he would actively welcome, as long as he'd approved them, um, agents in other countries. So you had a very thriving buckler scene in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um... Probably the, the well, arguably the one buckler model that is was instantly recognisable as a buckler is is the ninety, and this is a major step forward for Derek and was widely admired and seen as class leading um, for a few weeks until Colin Chapman unveiled the Frank Costin design Lotus Mark Eight. That man Chapman again. <laughs> um, but a ninety was because it was claimed it could do 90, 90 miles per hour, and that was as simple as that. That was the reasoning for that one. Um, one thing should be said really Derek was pretty handy at um, aerodynamics um, and in many ways he was slightly ahead with the 90 he was slightly ahead of that great tamer of the wind and another hero of mine Frank Costin uh, and Charles Bulmer the man at the motor magazine and a technical genius had helped him with the aerodynamics on the 90 um, and it certainly was a very slippery shape uh, then came the DD1, which in a nutshell was a 90 with DD on. So the DD is obvious what that stands for. And there was a DD2. But that one was primarily designed to accept the Microplast Mistral glass fibre body. Although inevitably customers did fit other makes of body onto the car. And again, Derek liked to offer choice and bespoke stuff. So there was a DD2 for a Daimler V8, a DD2 for a Vincent bike engine. <coughs> Excuse me, and a four-seater called the DD24. If you knew his nomencl uh, nomenclature and his naming, then his, his model names and reasoning behind them were pretty easy to work out, actually. The BB100 was a, was an interesting one, 1958. That had, that that um, was a buckler backbone chassis, and BB stood for back, buckler backbone, with the hundred standing for the fact you could do 100 miles an hour in the 1172 trim. Derek was another one, well, well, sorry, another thing that Derek did was when the Ford overhead valve free cross flow range of engines came along, he quickly offered a lineup, a lineup of performance parts to cover them, or those engines. Um, 1959 saw the launch of the DD2 inspired Mark 17, and this was a DD2 that was intended to accept an Ashley GRP body shell, pretty much. That's all there was to that one, really. And his last model was the. Um, That was really his last Buckler inspired, designed by a Derek Buckler model. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Derek's uh, one another Derek's sons, Chad Buckler, had been quoted as saying that his father was effectively a workaholic, totally dedicated to his business and with no outside hobbies. And he would, as I said earlier, he would work all night to help a customer out. Uh, and Mark Cook confirmed this in an interview, I think it was, in Motorsport. Um, and, Mark, and Mark again also said that there was far too many options. There were, there were he reckoned, up to two dozen possible chassis kits listed in the catalogue. And he would make a, he'd produce a one-off chassis and he'd keep it on the, on the price list with the hope that he'd sell another one. And that was kind of how it was, really. And he, uh, But Mark also went on to say that he, he didn't, feel that Derek really grasped the financial implications of producing a one-off in terms of time and cost. And uh, he'd sell beautifully bespoke, crafted products at a bargain price. 
and he did that because he was a kind and generous man. Um, he did work for other companies as well. There was commercial stuff for, notably, a pre-knighted Jack Brabham and Ron Toranac um, before they set up Brabham and Motor Racing Developments in the UK. Uh, didn't have a workshop. Derek was entrusted to make their early chassis. <coughs> Not only fabricating them, but Ron Toranac, a, 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 well, a legendary chassis designer, would give him a free hand to make any changes that he saw fit. Quite an accolade, that. And then he was also producing um, single-seaters, or chassis for single-seaters, for Cooper Cars uh, in-house driving school. Now, Derek was a chain smoker and a workaholic, as we've heard, uh, and he suffered a heart attack in 1954. Um, and it was the pressure of running to, well, well everything all, all mounted up, I think. In 58, he engaged the services of a guy called Peter Hilton, as his assistant and who became a co-director of Buckler Cars. Um, and when karting became massive in the UK in 1959, Derek waited uh, until 60, 1960, before he entered the fray. But by then he really was uh, grasping the concept of karts and offered um, a variety of models that were pretty successful. But as far as the cars were concerned, other companies... And there were plenty of special companies and people offering speed parts. Uh, VW Derrington, Speedex, Dante, Aquaplane, <coughs> Cambridge Engineering, uh, you name it. Allard were even doing it by the mid-50s. And I think a lot of them had seen what um, Derek and LMB had done and chipped away at it and maybe um, enhanced the way it was produced or sold. And that definitely hit the likes of Buckler, as did the arrivals or the arrival of um, the, the comprehensive kit by the likes of Lotus, TVR, Gilburn, Janetta, Diva, Elva, who Derek got on very well with Frank Nichols at Elva, by the way. And rather than react to what they were doing, he carried on doing what he was doing. Um, and even though they were highly regarded by that, though, that time, they might have been sort of beaten by some of the others in terms of their quality and sophistication. Put my teeth in. Like everyone, though, the arrival of the Mini and the Austin Healy Sprite, for example, in 1959 hit everybody, not just Derek. Um, 1962 sort of was a time when, under definitely due to doctor's orders, he sold buckler cars to, 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 to two guys, Mike, Mike Luff and Frank Fletcher, who changed the name to Buckler Engineering. They seem to be doing very well and, 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 and certainly went to the January 1965 racing car show at Olympia's uh, National Hall with all guns blazing, with, with a very um, buoyant stand with, with news of models. They were car sales and brokerage um, and spare parts for same, as well as Buckler's carts. They were very much promoting those as well as other Buckler material. But then after the show, they seemed to have disappeared very, very quickly. Um, meanwhile, Derek had retained the precision engineering division of his company, the, the performance parts and such like, and all the precision and engineering work. <clears throat> and even though uh, Hilton moved on, I think, to pursue an interest in aviation, um, when Derek's stroke uh, in 1964 was pretty debilitating, and sadly, he didn't recover from that, and uh, he died soon after. He was just 53 years of age. Um, he'd certainly lived a life and, and worked very, very hard. Uh, but it's such a shame he died at such a young age. Nothing. 53. Mark Cook um, was on the scene still, and he continued to run Buckler Reading, as it was called, the engineering side was called, until 68, before it sadly went into voluntary liquidation. Derek's wife, or Derek's widow, Molly, she inherited the Crowthorn Works property um, on Derek's death, and it was leased to... Johnny Offord, the last uh, body um, uh, panel beater that Derek uh, had on site. Importance uh, of Derek Buckler to the UK's automotive, or especially specialist car industry, is massive, of course. He wouldn't have foreseen what he was doing. Uh, he wouldn't understand that we were celebrating his 75th or the 75th anniversary of his launch of his first uh, chassis kit. 
And knowing him, he probably wouldn't understand. And, but I think he'd get a slight satisfaction and a little smile. Um, his motivation was never about money or stardom. He wanted to give people value for money. It's very hard to get a handle on exactly how many bucklers were sold. Reliable estimates from people that should know suggest 300 plus. Um, and it's definitely thought that of those, over 100 would have been the Mark V stroke Mark VI. Um, and I just think it's it's a great his memory and, and exploits are kept alive by the good folk at the Historic Specials Club and the Buckler Car Register run by um, his younger son, his youngest son, Malcolm. In fact, that's been that's been promoting or the, the memory of Derek since 1971 when that club was set up. Uh, and Malcolm and many others do some sterling work keeping um, Buckler's name alive, memory alive, making pe- people aware of what Buckler cars did and giving support to existing owners, of which there are still many. You go to those um, historic specials days, at, uh, wonderful historic specials days at uh, Burford in early August every year, and you'll see some fantastic examples of of what Buckler did. Um and look at some of the photos we've got here um, with this video, which I do hope you enjoy, by the way. Uh, finally, I uh, must recommend a book by an, a chap called Brian Malin, produced way back in 2001. Um, it's worth contacting the Buckler Car Register just to see if they that's still around, that book, or if they've got copies of it or um, PDFs of it or something. Um, it was called Bucklers, Sports, Cars, Specials and Carts. And it really is a, a, a good, fun thing. Just finally, before we finish this one, uh, it's a bit longer, this episode, so do forgive me on that. But I thought I didn't want to make it a two-parter. I just wanted to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Derek's first kit car. Uh, next time you jump into your kit car or you see your mate's kit car, just give a quick thought to Derek Buckler. Well, just, just a quick one. As without him... You might not have built it or acquired it. <coughs> so don't forget, just just give him a little, wish him a happy, or wish, uh, wish the industry a happy 75th birthday in 2024. Thanks, Derek. We'll always remember you, mate. Anyway, wherever you are in the world, I wish you a great day. Thanks for taking the time to come and visit our humble little channel. Um, and I hope you enjoyed what you, you heard here. If you've lasted this long and you haven't already subscribed, if you'd be kind enough, please, to do so. won't cost you a penny piece. Um, and if you could also hit that like button because that helps our algorithm and it gets the, the channel. It helps us to bring more content. It helps us get this channel into the pe- feeds of more enthusiasts with the hope that they'll like and subscribe too. If you could head over to uh, the, uh, our, our associate with these videos, Enwin Motors channel. If you could go over there and uh, do what I asked you to do here, subscribe and like, that would be greatly uh, appreciated. And wherever you are in the world, uh, currently where I'm sitting at the moment, it's absolutely hacking it down with rain. It's a, I think it's freezing today. So if you're sitting in the Marish on a beach in, in the Maldives or somewhere, I'm not jealous at all. Just thanks for visiting and uh, I'll see you next time. See ya. Hello and welcome to a brand new collaboration between Enwin's Motors YouTube channel and the TKC Magazine YouTube channel. Now, those of you familiar with the channels and if you're watching this on Patreon, surely you are, will know that we've had a lot of success with our History File series where we take the magazine's extensive photo archive and provide voiceover to explain the stories of some of the cars and the manufacturers and the people of the industry in the past that helped to make the industry we have today. Well, what we're doing on this series is a similar thing using the video archive from both channels to create more extensive videos on various cars or types of cars by combining the video archive from both channels we can actually show a little bit more to our individual Patreon supporters than you would get from one of the channels individually. Moreover, after 12 months this will then filter onto YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube there are another 11 episodes waiting for you on Patreon. So if you enjoyed it 
then why not go to one of the Patreon pages for Nwins Motors or TKC Magazine and catch up on the rest. Anyway, without further ado, here is this month's video. Thank <laughs> you. 